those who are joining us. My name is Rosemary Blanchard. I am the facilitator of this uh, webinar. And uh, I'll introduce myself because you don't need to know who I am as much as you need to know who some of the others are. So I might as well introduce myself first while people are still joining. I am uh, a founding member of Human Rights Educators USA. I am a retired uh, ed, uh, associate professor of education from Sacramento State, a retired social science associate professor from a two-year branch at the University of New Mexico, and a recovering lawyer. I got into law because I was interested in civil rights law, and I ended up a divorce lawyer in Helena, Montana, supporting my family by helping people shred theirs. And so when I got out of that situation, I knew there was one thing I was never going to do again <laughs> and found my way into human rights education as a wonderful place to be compared to where I had been <laughs> in my private practice. So uh, our, so I will introduce the themes and then I will introduce our panel, the rest of our panelists. Okay. The questions that for National Civics Week that we're looking at really are, what kind of civics should we teach? And the answer really is, what kind of a society do we want to build? And I got that connection from Ira Harkavy, who is the chair of the International Consortium on Higher Education, Civic Responsibility and Democracy. So he should know. Civics doesn't necessarily mean supporting democracy. We need to remember that. Um, Thomas Hobbes, a 17th century philosopher, British philosopher, many of us had to study in school, believed in order and obedience. And that's what he thought young people should be taught. He did not want to see Athenian democracy taught or too much Aristotle because it might raise questions about the monarchy and people might start asking whether they should have that. And for that matter, Adolf Hitler praised a teacher of his who, as he, to quote a translation of Mein Kampf, used our budding nationalistic fanaticism as a means of educating us and was thus able to discipline us little ruffians more easily than would have been possible by any other means. So civics can lead to some very undemocratic outcomes. We want to do better than that. And there are better examples of how democracy can be supported by civic education and the supports that are put around civic education. One example, and you'll get a link to it in the resources, is the Council of Europe's Charter on Education for Democratic Citizenship and Human Rights Education, where the members of the uh, Council of Europe have agreed that these two things should go together. And, uh, should be, and they have developed many materials in that regard. Another is the Educating for American Democracy Roadmap, which includes references to human rights as a necessary part of this education. Uh, and the National Council for the Social Studies has adopted position statements, including statements on a statement on human rights education. Next slide, please. So there is a place for human rights if we are going to have a civics that is going to be a civics for a democratic society. Did we get the next slide? Next slide. There we are. So, okay, the key questions for this webinar are what are civic democratic civic values and behaviors? What is human rights education? How does it support the understanding and practice of democratic civic values and behaviors? How can human rights education be effectively integrated into an overall program of civil, civic education at all grade levels? And then what are some of the strategies for engaging youth participation and fostering youth leadership, building a human rights supportive civil society? Okay, next slide. And so our panelists uh, are going to uh, are are going to I'm going to do Jessica first because she's going to be the first person who talks to us. Uh, Jessica Tara Bruger, which I'm sure I have uh, pronounced dreadfully, Bruggen, is an international education specialist working at the intersection of human rights and literary arts. And she is someone who is very 
very familiar with working within the Council of Europe in the related fields of civic ed, uh, education for citizenship and uh, democratic citizenship and human rights education. John Terry is a K-12 supervisor of social studies for the Bernards Township School District in New Jersey, an adjunct professor at East Strasburg University in education and is a longtime member of Human Rights Educators USA, which has not in any way undercut his ability to oversee social studies in a whole school district. In fact, John is living proof it can be done. Sandy Soko, the founding director of the World As It Could Be Human Rights Education Program, a program that uses the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the creative arts to connect students with their own value as human beings and their society. So, and then I will let Sandy tell you more about it, but she's mostly done with, worked with middle school and high school students, but now she and Natalia Anciso, who are another member of our panel, are working with second graders, which is one of my favorite ages to introduce human rights and human rights education. And using creativity and a program that, uh, is I am me and I am part of us to get students to feel strong about who they are and strong in their relationship to all the other human beings they share the community and the planet with. So that's how we're going to uh, go forward. Next slide. That's going to be the folks that tell us how it can actually be done where they're doing it. So what are democratic civic values and behaviors? I'm going to very briefly touch on what the uh, National Organization Civics Now says. To govern ourselves, sustain our communities, they say we need understanding of law, government, and social issues. We need skills, interpersonal skills for discussing and working together when we disagree. We need a commitment to preserving and improving our society and to the rights and interests of all people, not just ourselves. And human rights? From the Human Rights Educators USA website, it's a lifelong process of teaching and learning human rights education for individuals, groups, and communities to develop human rights scholarship uh, knowledge, skills, and values to exercise and protect human rights for themselves and for others, and to meet our responsibilities under internationally recognized and nationally recognized human rights principles. We often don't know they've been nationally recognized too. I don't know why that's not been the part of our education that it should be. And then we do this because we want to achieve justice and peace in the world. And we want to be a part of the process of creating that justice and peace. And we want it to include us. We want to know it's not at the expense of our humanity, but it's because of our humanity that we are building a more peaceful world. So that's where we go now. I'm going to very next slide very briefly. I'm not going to really go into the details of it, but I do want to encourage people to look to the National Council for the Social Studies. It has a position statement on human rights education and that recognizes the importance of human rights education and its integration into social studies curricula, school wide policies, and classroom practices. And this is, I think, very important for National Civics Learning Week because uh, National Council for the Social Studies is a bellwether uh, professional organization for social studies educators. And they are domestic. And they say that democratic civics and human rights education must go together if we are to really preserve a inclusive democracy or build one. So next slide. Fortunately, and again, you'll get the details on this from our resources. National Council for the Social Studies, when they developed the national standards for the credentialing of uh, teachers of social studies, and they are the national organization that credentials programs that educate uh, social studies teachers, um, they recognized in their standard five that uh, candidates to be social studies teachers should be both guiding their students and themselves to promote human rights through informed action in school and communities. So that is part of being a social studies teacher. Now, many social studies teachers, good thing we have professional development instead of just the preparation of new teachers, because for many years, 
Human rights was not part of the education of people in the United States, especially not its domestic applications. This certainly was true for me, who went through elementary and uh, even the first part of high school in the 50s. And it was the time of the uh, McCarthy era, the Red Scare. Human rights was not talked about. And so now we say teachers need to teach this. And that's why it's very important that we help our teachers, not only those who are becoming teachers, but those who have long time been teachers, to integrate human rights, education, and understandings into their own pedagogy so that they can, in fact, do this. They can, in fact, integrate that respect for all humans as an American value and as a global value into what they, pre into what they present to their students. So that being said, let's go on. Another slide. Okay, I'm going to ask our panelist, Jessica Terbruggen, to tell us a little bit about her knowledge and experience of the Council of Europe, where there is that charter on human rights education and education for democratic citizenship. Thank you so much, Rosemary. So yes, to kind of build upon all of the foundation that, that Rosemary just laid out for us here, I had the pleasure of going and, and participating in one of the review cycles for the Council of Europe on their charter for HRE EDC integration into the non-formal and formal sectors of education in Europe. And so just to give you a brief overview of that charter um, and kind of the process that they're going through as an example of how we might look to a type of overall broad integration here, um, it was adopted in 2010. The charter was adopted in 2010. The Council of Europe signed this charter, um, you know, kind of mandating that democratic citizenship and civics education and human rights education be integrated across, again, the formal and non-formal sectors of education. And of course, it's not a legally binding document, but it does serve as an essential tool for helping that process along so that people have some type of guiding um, structure to help them know how to integrate it best. And there's a review cycle um, and, and further kind of, you know, filling in gaps and then applying again and then review cycle again. So it is based on very simply what Rosemary outlined in the previous slide is that education plays a vital role in promoting democracy, human rights, and core, the core values of freedom, equity, and justice. Uh, next slide, please. So again, and, and Rosemary kind of touched on this as well, the link between EDC civics and HRE, um, but just to kind of confirm uh, this is also the same way that the Council of Europe views it. So they are interrelated and mutually supportive, and they differ in focus and scope, but not in the goals and the practices in the end. Um, and the EDC civics education, as Rosemary also pointed out, is primarily focused on democratic rights, responsibilities, all of our active participation in the democratic process, um, and, and the human rights component is concerned with the broader spectrum of fundamental freedoms for all of us. But you can see how these two are, um, you know, they go hand in hand. They you really need both to really get at the objective of creating a strong foundation for democratic practice. Uh, next slide, please. So if we click on when we will, if you could click on the, the objectives and provisions link in the middle, um, we, I obviously, you know, you can look at this, you'll have access to this. It's on the um, resource document, but just to give you a brief glance at it, if you look at some of the provisions, if you scroll down to the provision section, you can really get a sense for, um, of course, you can look at all of their objectives, but it really helps you to get a sense for, oh, sorry, maybe I, it was under, um, keep going back up. Okay, sorry, right here. So policies, I apologize. Um, it was policies. You just passed it. Go back down a little more. I'm so sorry, Jasmine. Thank you. Okay, right here. Policies. Yes. So policies, not provisions. So if you look, you can get a sense if you want to go back in and look at this in greater detail, since we don't have time to go over it thoroughly right now, but you can see 
the broad strokes of how they're trying to integrate it. So they're they're addressing the member states within Europe, and they're they're looking at how they can apply it in formal education, pre-primary, primary, secondary level, also vocational education. I was doing some work with. Um, a, a group in the Netherlands who was working on the integration of this in vocational settings as well. Also the promotion of it, you know, academic freedom in higher education, um, looking at the governance of educational institutions. So it really crosses over a lot of, of broad areas. The training, so they have in the in the last review cycle, a gap that was identified was that teachers really did want to do this. They all saw the value in it, but they needed more training. And so one of the latest you know, cycles is that they are upping the training of educators. So they're running a lot of training um, opportunities and workshops that, that, that the Council of Europe is running now. And so all of these, you can, again, you can go in and look at it, but it covers member states obligations toward research, um, continued evaluation, um, upskilling for teachers. So Anyway, this is, um, it's a great example and a great model of how these things can be broadly applied in formal and non-formal sectors. And I will pass it over to Sandy and Natalia. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> and one thing I forgot to tell our, our viewers and attenders is that we are not putting uh, questions in the chat, but if you have questions for us, we do have a Q&A category uh, on, in this webinar. And if you put questions in the question and answer place, we will address those that we can when we finish with our presentation. So please tell us what your questions are in the Q&A. Now, back to what we're doing next. Next slide. This is John Terry. Yeah, John, 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 you're the next. John, sorry. Yep. No worries. Um, th thank you, Rosemary, uh, for the incredibly informative overview of how civic education and human rights and education can, can work together, right, and support each other. And, and thank you to Jess for providing that really uh, insightful uh, window into some really great practices and models that exist outside of the United States, right? Because um, you know, I think everybody on this panel can probably agree, right? There's a whole lot of work that we need to do here in the United States, and looking for models beyond our borders is, is certainly a great, great place to to go for inspiration. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, what I'm going to talk a little bit about are um, some specific, um, you know, uh, developments um, that I've, you know, been part of and witnessed in my own local context, uh, both in a school district as well as in the state of New Jersey. Um, and I can kind of speak to how things have developed here. Um, and, and hopefully uh, you folks who are watching this webinar can take away some, some useful um, you know, materials and, and ideas. Um, so New Jersey, um, you know, I, I do like to point out uh, at this point, we are number one in public schools in the United States. Um, however, um, when it comes to civic education, uh, I don't think we've been number one, frankly. Um, a lot of states do require uh, civics to be taught uh, at the high school level and in secondary education, but we in New Jersey have not had a requirement for civic education or a standalone civic course in uh, the secondary level until 2021. Um, so, you know, I, there's been a lot of advocacy for this for years, um, but it, I think it really did take uh, the events of January 6th. Um, to motivate a lot of folks uh, in our state legislature um, to move the ball, uh, you know, into the end zone. And uh, it was a unanimous, unanimously passed bipartisan piece of legislation that said that we're going to require at least one semester of civics at the middle school level in New Jersey. Um, so that's called Laura Wooten's Law. It's it's linked on the, the slideshow and it's also in our resources bundle. So folks can access that if they want to see the text of the legislation. Um, but uh, what the, the law did was not only did it require civic education, but it also um, basically asked uh, an organization that's based out of Rutgers University called the New Jersey Center for Civic Education uh, to focus on developing uh, an inquiry framework and curriculum guide uh, that will guide teachers and, and, and school districts efforts to implement 
um, you know, what the civics education will look like at the middle school level. Um, and those materials are also linked for you in our resource guide um, that we'll that we'll show you at the end of our presentation today. Um, but just to kind of give you a quick little overview of what you might find in an inquiry framework, um, it begins with um, a discussion of, you know, uh, or not discussion, but a series of, you know, activities and experiences about foundational concepts and principles in civics. Uh, the next unit that they get into is foundational documents and institutions. Uh, and then after that, it gets into, you know, what are our American ideals and what has been our lived experience so far? So that's where things get really, really interesting, right? So we're basically comparing our lived experience to what are our ideals, right? And this is where things kind of get really, really um, potentially controversial in the classroom and, and the teachers I work with are, are currently doing their best to navigate that. And then the fourth unit has to deal with the doing civics, right? Being actively engaged citizens. Um, and in all four of those units, um, I believe that there is immense potential for integrating human rights principles uh, to really inform that work. Um, through the work that I do with Human Rights Educators USA, uh, some of our New Jersey are actively engaged New Jersey members. We did, you know, reach out to the New Jersey Center for Civic Education, and we advocated for the inclusion of human rights principles in the inquiry framework. So you'll find references to human rights in the inquiry framework. Um, the folks at the center said that they were already thinking about human rights. So I can't really speak to the, the impact that we had necessarily, but you will find human rights principles uh, embedded and in, integrated to an extent in the inquiry framework. Um, from there, um, you know, the task was we uh, educators in New Jersey, we have to put our heads together to figure out how are we going to implement this right in our school districts in our classrooms. Uh, there was a really great conference um, that was hosted by a few civically oriented school administrators at Montclair State University. Um, I uh, brought together um, a few uh, students of mine um, to be youth presenters, along with myself and another um, school administrator. Um, from the school district that I used to work at. And we kind of talked a little bit about how can you infuse human rights education and civics. Um, and, you know, hopefully that, you know, inspired some interesting conversations in classrooms. And the New Jersey Center for Civic Education has also been providing uh, regular, you know, statewide teacher trainings. Um, a lot of them are based at Rutgers University, but we're really, really trying to make sure that teachers feel professionally prepared to do this work. So, uh, Jasmine, if you'd be kind enough to take us to the next slide. Thank you very much. I can talk a little bit about our local context, right? So I am the K-12 social studies supervisor in a district called Bernard Township Schools. Um, and the work that I've been doing there, uh, thankfully, we do have something called Staff College, where our um, staff members in, in the school district, they are required to take professional development in-house training. Uh, and I teamed up with a couple educators uh, that I work with uh, to provide PD on civics. And this PD that we provided, it was a full day called Civically Engaging Students for a Better Democracy. And we weaved in human rights principles throughout, um, you know, our presentation. So we had, you know, and they weren't just social studies teachers either, right? So they were math teachers and science teachers and special ed teachers, just thinking about how can we engage our students and help them see the connection between their classrooms and, you know, the environment beyond the school building. Um, and so we introduce everybody there to the UDHR. We also introduce folks to great programs like, you know, Sandy's program, The World As It Could Be. Um, and we looked at the universe of obligation. So we really wanted to make sure that folks were also thinking about the learning environment, right? So, you know, we're not just teaching kids about human rights, but we're teaching kids you know, how to learn through human rights, right? So in their learning environment, what are we doing to support everybody's human rights in the classroom? And also what are we doing to advocate for human rights uh, beyond the classroom, right? So the about for and through human rights are integral to human rights education. Um, as far as our middle school civics course goes, um, you know, I worked with a team of teachers last summer where we basically took a lot of our human rights principles that we learned in PD, um, we took the inquiry framework, we kind of wedded the two together, and we came up with this really, really dynamic curriculum uh, that is currently being taught for the first time this school year, which I'm really, really proud of and excited for our teachers um, that are teaching the course. Um, but like I was saying before, they are navigating some interesting challenges. 
right? So for example, on that, you know, how well are we living up to our American ideals? Well, the teachers are teaching about LGBT rights movements of the 60s and 70s, right? This is a historical development. Um, and, you know, the representation of some of these folks advocating for rights um, is not something that all of our community members are necessarily thrilled about, right? So, you know, one of the challenges uh, that our teachers is facing and, and that I'm facing, right, are how do we make sure that we navigate these in a way that's really appropriate, um, you know, that that is uh, meaningful, impactful, that upholds human rights and dignity, um, but then also, you know, when we speak with community members, how can we educate community members about why we're doing this, right? It's not about a particularly liberal agenda, right? It's about human rights and dignity. And when we frame it that way, um, you know, I, I really hope that, that folks are listening. Um, so, um, Jasmine, if you don't mind moving on to the next slide, thank you very much. Um, I can just kind of talk about a few other experiences that I've had. Um, maybe just for the sake of time, I'll just highlight a few of them. Uh, one of them is, uh, as a member of Human Rights Educators USA, I'm the New Jersey Regional Representative um, for that organization. And, and prior to that work, I, I was just was working with a team of folks here in New Jersey, one of them uh, being Professor Bill Fernickes, who was our New Jersey Regional Rep before me. And he was um, basically leading the way with creating a curriculum integration guide, right? So how can we integrate human rights education uh, in our traditional curriculum that we're teaching. So if you go to that resource at the HRE USA website, you will find a series of model lessons. Um, the ones that I created were on teaching the civil rights movement. And there's another one on teaching um, workers' rights and you know 19th century industrializing society. And if you look at those lessons, those might provide you with some ideas about how to creatively uh, you know, infuse human rights principles and, and curriculum that might not otherwise be explicitly human rights oriented. Um, I created a human rights elective course um, at a school district that I taught in, Wayne Public Schools. Uh, you'll find, uh, you know, um, a link to that um, curriculum document and our resources bundle as well. Um, the folks that I work with in Bernard's Township Schools, um, they do provide uh, a couple experiences for students at the high school level and at the middle school level where kids can be doing the work of citizenship, right, where they're trying to actively solve problems in their communities, right, they do research, um, they investigate a, a problem that they feel is real and, and you know, urgent in their lives. Um, we try to integrate human rights principles where we can, um, but it's really about kids feeling actively, you know, engaged in uh, the work of citizenry and, uh, you know, uh, gain a sense of agency through that work. Um, and I also, I train educators uh, and pre-service educators, uh, pre-service educators in particular um, through my work at East Stroudsburg University. Um, it's a teaching of social studies course. It's a social studies methods course that I teach, but I make sure that, you know, all the folks who leave that class, uh, by the time they get to the classroom, they're familiar with the basics of human rights education. So uh, at this point, um, I will turn over the baton to Sandy and Natalia. Okay. Thank you, Thank John. You. And Sandy, co-author, it is so good to see what you are doing finding its way to the primary grade. So introduce us to your colleague, Natalia, and tell us what you guys have been doing. All right. Well, I'll start. I think perhaps I'll start with just a, an introduction to the world as it could be program and then bring Natalia in to describe what we're doing in her second grade class. Uh, the world as it could be a human rights education program began uh, in 2006 uh, and it came, it, it, it's evolved out of kind of a new, unexpected circumstances. At the time, I was the executive director of the Rex Foundation which was actually started by the rock and roll group, The Grateful Dead. And I was trying to raise awareness about human rights as a way of connecting all the different grants that we were making in all different areas of uh, community support. And uh, to bring it to life and to demonstrate our interest in the arts, I went to uh, our grantee, the San Francisco Mime Troop Youth Theater Project to ask if they'd help us dramatize uh, the importance of human rights, which led to a collaboration of three arts-based organizations, uh, the 
uh, Mime Troop Youth Theater Project, Destiny Arts and Youth Speaks. And we created an original production that was called The World As It Could Be, A Declaration of Human Rights. And the, the name evolved out of people in our production group reading the Universal Declaration. And one of the adults said, wow, I didn't know this document existed, but it basically spells out the world as it could be. So that became the name of our first original production, which was presented by 20 high school youth. And it was done in front of one night in front of nonprofit leaders. And the second night and the second day in front of a full auditorium of students at Balboa High School in San Francisco. And that is what led us to develop our curriculum. What happened was uh, nobody knew about the Universal Declaration from the teachers to the principal of the school to the, the leaders of our uh, arts groups uh, and the students who were supposed to be learning this. And yet when the students learned about the Universal Declaration, they got very excited and they said, wow, this is something we can really get behind. This is something we could fight for. And what made that happen in part was the creative arts as a vehicle for, for the students to almost viscerally learn the concepts related to human rights principles. And so because the Universal Declaration is supposed to be taught in high school, uh, in, at least at that time in California, in the 11th grade, because the arts were not being funded as well as they should have been at the time, um, we developed curriculum that integrated the use of the creative arts as well as a culminating presentation because it was the experience the youth had of being the teachers that was also transformational. And we, we developed the curriculum which was published in 2010 and which you'll have a link to uh, at the closing slide. And we uh, basically uh, integrate creative arts into all of our lesson plans and include a culminating presentation. And essentially we teach what is the Universal Declaration? Uh, how is it connected to you personally by writing personal stories? Uh, what are some of these concepts that you ought to know more about? And even doing things like uh, body sculptures of what justice looks like so that students are, are, in, are basically embodying some of the concepts that would otherwise be dry words on a document. We teach the, the students about the universe of obligation, about uh, what it means to care about those around you and not and be an upstander rather than a bystander. And we have students do research on issues or people that relate to the articles that they care about and ultimately do a culminating presentation about what they have learned. And um, it has been quite exciting to see how students have adapted to this. I'll start by saying before I get to Natalia very quickly, last week I got to see a town hall put on by a junior class at a high school that's been using our curriculum since 2007. They helped us pilot it. The students came up with their theme which was called the path to light. They presented soliloquies of issues they care about and what they wanted to do about it. They had an element of how light was shining on the issues so they could work on it. And they stated that by learning about the Universal Declaration, it gave them a place to put the issues they were worried about in, a, in, in the perspective that now they knew what was missing. They knew where the gaps were and they knew they could do something about it. And this is what is exciting to us about uh, students learning about this important document that's part of our history and part of our lives and how they can integrate it into their own daily lives and apply civic engagement in their communities to take action to, to address the issues they care about. And this brings me now to wanting to introduce you to Natalia Ansiso. We have been connected since 2011. Natalia, Natalia took our second uh, institute to learn about our curriculum. She is a very talented visual artist and teacher. And she has been applying our curriculum elements to her kindergarten and second grade classes for the last several years. And we've written about that in our, on our website. But this year, this fall, uh, Natalia and I collaborated and to develop a project we call I Am Me and I Am Part of Us. 
And the idea was to actually demonstrate how to use elements for our curriculum at the elementary level. And uh, the idea is that our, this work would complement what Natalia was already planning to do around social emotional learning and social studies. And um, I'm gonna now turn it over to Natalia because I'd like Natalia to be able to explain how she has applied uh, the information she's gleaned from the world as it could be in her work and particularly what her experience has now been with I am me and I am part of us. So Natalia. Thank you, Sandy. Um, yeah, so I did the Institute with Sandy in 2011 and I really, I loved it um, so much and I went back um, following year. And during that time I was working in a lot of nonprofits and after school um, programs. And I started, I, I work with younger youth um, so it was with middle school and then I really love elementary and I wanted to take this curriculum and see if I could use it with the younger ones. Um, because I mean, what better, you know, it, how amazing would it be to like, take what we're doing and start like really young, like with kinder. Um, so that they already have that going into the upper grades, going into middle school, going into high school. Um, so I took elements from the curriculum, uh, especially those around social emotional learning and social studies. Um, and I kind of like by myself and then with I, um, when I worked in San Lorenzo, um, I had a really great colleague. And we talked about how can we make this age appropriate um, for students like that are five years old, seven years old. Um, how do we make it appropriate? And how can we integrate the arts more? And not only the arts, but with younger kids, play. How do we integrate play? Because that's how they learn. They learn by play, they learn through exploration. Um, and so, this year, Sandy and I decided to, you know, like focus a little bit more in my class. I am at Cesar Chavez Elementary. I teach in a bilingual classroom and we are having the students write poems about who they are as people and their community. Um, hence the name, like, I am, I'm part of us. And I think um, we have slide showing one of the poems, if I'm not mistaken, just if there's the next slide, just so you can see it. There it is. And so this was done um, prior to this. I do an ancestors unit for social studies. So we talked about our families, where our families came from. I'm um, Cesar Chavez is a bilingual pathway school. And so many of our students um, they're either first, a lot of them are first generation or a lot of them are newcomers. So they are like very new to the country. Um, and so we just, we talked about our past and how that builds us, that, how that makes us. And so these poems are I am poems, which are really simple. I mean, they're second graders. Um, we talked about like the food our family's food. Um, we talked about like the music, a lot of them because they're newcomers, like we did a soundscape, Sandy wasn't there for that, but we, a soundscape, which is one of the activities in the curriculum of like, um, I have a lot of students from Honduras. And what did we hear? What did we hear when we were in Honduras? What did we hear outside? What did we hear outside of our homes? What did we hear in our homes? And um, a lot of them were like the birds singing or the dogs barking. Um, the sound of my, I, I know one student talked about like the sound of his mother cooking. Um, and we, and then we talked about, you know, who they are as people. So, um, you know, kids get overlooked um, a lot of times. And so like, 
they talked about how they're artists and how they're like intelligent and smart. And we connected that um, to the writing curriculum um, because I think John had mentioned like we're learning through human rights and like how do we integrate that with the things that they're pushing so much in school, which is like the reading and the math and the writing. And so all of this, I try to just integrate um, so while we were doing this, we talked about what is an adjective, what is a verb. Um, so we're getting that in, but we're also but really like we're focusing on like human rights and just how to be like good people. Um, and so that's that's an example. A lot of the poems like they came out really beautiful. They went back recently and some of them edited them. Um, they were editing the poems because they they were like, oh yeah, I I thought about this or like I recently like went back home and I could hear like my grandma talking and like my baby sister laughing and so they added those into the poems and it's it's just so funny like how they get so excited um and they love Sandy they call Miss Goody um, <laughs> um yeah and we're right now where they just finished up some artwork to go with their poems and we're working we're focusing more on community um and they're doing a mural and they are just so into this mural and uh, we're adding pictures, images of the mission. And um, they're like, oh yeah, the park, we have to put the park. We have to put like a picture of the school. And it's just so beautiful, like seeing how engaged they are um, and how they're working together. And I think uh, what we're doing on March 24th we're going to have the culminating presentation uh, where the students, I believe that, you know, we're, we're hoping that a number of their families will come, the school principal and assistant principal um, and other members of the, of the school community will come and watch them. And they're gonna recite this collective poem they've written about uh, their, what they're part of. And we're, we're compiling these poems and the collective poem into a book that they'll be able to receive as, as the final product of all this work that they've done together. And we're excited about the fact that I think that this will be very meaningful to them. And, and I think that, you know, just to add on to what Natalia has said, I think so much about this idea of human rights, especially with younger kids, you don't have to say, this is about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights per se, but you are providing an experience where they're feeling what it means to be a, a, a human being about for themselves as well as how to care for others. And it's really about the being of human rights that is particularly meaningful, I think, at this point. Yeah, and I think um, also, like just to add on really briefly, um, like it's just so important. I think like my, my school has a high turnover and as do like many like, you know, um, schools in the in the mission or in, you know, in communities where a community of color, um, lots of teachers go and then they end up leaving because it's, it's difficult. Um, using this curriculum has been so helpful because what a lot of those kids need, especially like our newcomers and like, they need, before like any of that learning happens, they need trust. They need like a safe community. And this curriculum that we're doing, that we use, like all these activities, like it builds that. It builds the trust uh, between the students and the teacher, between the students and, you know, between each other. Um, and they feel safe. They feel safe to express themselves. They like have, they start building that confidence um, and then all of that, you can see how it impacts like the other learning that, you know, that the, that the school and the district hold you accountable for, which is like the reading and the math. I've had so many students like, um, they're still below grade level, but they're growing and they're growing because they like want to write these poems. They want to like, they're excited to like read and share, um, and so it's, it's amazing. And so thank you, Sandy. I also, I wanted to know one other thing, and that is in our curriculum, one of the things we learned 
by the art programs that were helping the students develop their first presentation was the use of, of uh, theater games uh, to get kids warmed up and to kind of look at each other more straight in the eye. And we documented a number of those activities. Um, things like pass the clap, where you stand in a circle and the kids have to go around and clap in sync in synchronicity, synchronicity with each with each person. And um, what I like about those games, they, they could be used for any subject level and for any subject as a way of getting kids to sort of focus. But it's really helping them look each other in the eye, pay attention. And what's wonderful about it is everybody can participate. It doesn't matter what your reading level is or your math level. Everybody can play past the clap. And I've seen it, we do it with the second graders. Every time I'm there, we're trying zip zaps off and, and they're getting better and better. And you can see how they start looking at each other more. And these games are great at any level from elementary through high school. And we've certainly done it with adults in our institutes. Everybody, everybody gains from it. They're, they're sort of human rights exercises in and of themselves. So I think we're we're happy to. Did you want to say anything else, Natalia? Because I, I think we're ready to. Pass. I want to tell you thank you very much because what when I got into the field of social studies, which was very late in my career, because I was not a K twelve teacher, I was a policy wonk, was when I I met a man named Larry Senish who developed a. Uh, organic social studies curriculum that introduced the fundamental concepts of the main social sciences in so in uh, social studies material starting with first grade. And Larry, I, I met him at a New Year's Eve party and we got so busy talking to each other, we almost forgot New Year's Eve when, new, when the new year came in. What he had found as a college professor teaching economics was that students couldn't get the basic concepts and some of his colleagues thought, well, it's because we're trying to get it introduced in their freshman year. We should wait till they're sophomores or juniors. And Larry said, no, the problem is this is the first time they're being introduced to these concepts. They should have been introduced to the fundamental concepts. Larry was, was Hungarian American. I can hardly say it without putting in his accent, the fundamental concepts of the social sciences from their earliest grade levels. And to prove that he was right, he developed a first through fifth grade curriculum and practiced it out in the field. And I had the great gift of knowing him at the very end of his life and being a co-author on the last paper he ever published. And as I got more into human rights education, I kept thinking those fundamental concepts of human rights have got to be introduced in the primary grades or students are already too... <laughs> to set in their directions to be able to easily absorb them. When I see we're doing a human rights training, for example, for adults in their middle ages, okay, we've had brutality in our police department, so we're gonna do a human rights training to a bunch of 30 and 35 and 40 year old adults. I think, well, good luck. And not that it's not can't be done, but it's so much harder work what if they had learned these things in second grade for you folks who are doing it? And with that understanding, I want to take us to a, a bit of a group panel discussion here. And we are a little behind schedule. We may go over a minute or two, but panelists, um, can you talk with each other? I don't want to call on each of you individually, but I will start perhaps, let's see, what are some of the strategies for engaging youth participation and fostering youth leadership in building a human rights supportive civil society? Well, I feel like we've heard something from Sandy and from Natalia who are really leading the charge on doing this in my favorite, my favorite part of school, which is the primary grades. So I'm gonna start this with John Terry because you are, coordinating social studies for a whole school district. What are some of the strategies you and your teachers are coming up with? And, and, and you know, what are your reactions to what you've heard from Jessica, Sandy, and Natalia? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll start by making just a few, you know, holistic overarching points and, and you know, for, for everybody to consider um, and then talk about a couple examples. Um, but students really have to see the relevance of this content to their lives, right? Um, that has to be, you know, the, the very, very first piece of this, right? Students have to see the, the connections, right? And it's not just, human rights is not just something that's abstract. Um, I think that um, a lot of uh, teachers in the United States and folks in the United States in general, when you hear human rights, you kind of think of human rights as issues over there, right, that exist in other countries, right? So it's really important to center discussion of human rights um, and help students to see those connections to their, their communities and, and their lives. Um, another thing, too, that I think is really important for students to understand is that um, they have to understand that support for others' human rights uh, strengthens support for their own human rights. Um, and I know that this is you know, particularly true and important uh, when working with students of privilege, for example, um, students in more affluent communities, um, students from more dominant, um, you know, groups, um, you know, it's really important for them to see also that, you know, uh, protecting human rights is not just about protecting other people's human rights, it's that we're all linked together, right? And if we're supporting human rights for anybody else, uh, that serves all of us equally. Um, and then another thing too, you know, if we're trying to inspire youth participation and youth leadership, uh, teachers have to work really closely with students and helping them feel a sense of confidence um, that they can do this work, right? So, you know, starting with piecemeal steps and maybe doing research or, or action, um, focusing on something that's local rather than something global usually tends to go a long way in terms of building students' sense of self-efficacy and agency to address human rights problems. Um, so it might even be taking a look at something in your school district, right? There's a resource that a lot of folks here on this panel are familiar with, taking the human rights temperature of your school, for example. Um, that's a really great resource that, that students could use to kind of, um, you know, basically determine and, and, you know, evaluate how well are human rights supported in their schools. And then that could really generate a really interesting discussion and be a launch point for the kinds of work that students can do. Um, a couple examples of programs that I mentioned before, one is the Center for Civic Education's Project Citizen. Um, while it doesn't explicitly mention human rights that I'm aware of, um, I think a lot of what we're talking about here, actively engaged citizenship, it's easy to integrate human rights knowledge and principles into that work. And then also the Human Rights Watch um, Student Task Force is a really, really great program uh, that's accessible for, for students, uh, grades K through 12. Um, I think it leans a little more secondary ed, but I, I, and I've certainly also worked with students who felt inspired to do work with them. The human rights elective course that I was talking about that I taught in Wayne, New Jersey, um, students who finished that course felt like, well, what do we do now, right? We have this human rights knowledge, right? We have this passion for, for addressing human rights issues. So what can we do next? And I introduced them to the Human Rights Watch Student Task Force. And last year, uh, their uh, campaign was specifically dedicated to issues around climate justice. Um, so the handful of students that I worked with that decided to you know, pursue this, this was after school hours, um, they ended up you know, advocating for you know, um, you know, renewable energy sources and and you know, greener approaches and and climate sustainable approaches to, you know, how we do schooling uh, in our school district. Um, so those are a couple of quick examples um, and some ideas that I got I could offer folks. But I'd also love to hear from other panelists as well. Yes, indeed. And uh, Sandy, you might want to share a little about. Uh, what your program has done at some other grade levels where your students have taken some very active community engaging uh, activities. All right, I'd be happy to. I, I was going to mention we have uh, we have an after school rite of passage program that we've documented that's also that there'll be a link to. And um, we've had that going for about seven years until the pandemic put a kind of an end to it. But in those classes, the students, as part of learning about the Universal Declaration, they look at issues that they that they feel are 
connected to articles in the UDHR. And so we've had projects like, they've come up with community uh, action projects. One was called Wellness is for Everyone. The students identified that stress and anxiety was actually keeping them from experiencing their right to an education. And they developed a, a, they developed a campaign to encourage kids to go to the wellness center that had just opened. They created a class to take to all these other classes on mindfulness as a strategy for dealing with anxiety. And um, uh, they, they developed a, a great uh, culminating presentation on how to put down your phone and, and connect more with others. Uh, another community action project was around uh, bringing access to uh, uh, menstrual hygiene products to have them be free in all the classrooms because the issue was that young girls were actually being humiliated in their classes if they had to use the restroom and it was also creating a problem with their right to an education. And so they developed a program which is still going on. They created a poster that supported uh, how uh, natural it is to have uh, menstruation as part of a person's development. And then they made sure that products are available that are still there for free. Um, those are just two examples, and they're all, these are all documented, um, as well as videos of all the different student presentations that show how they've connected what they've learned about the UDHR to their real life situations. Well, thank you. That's, that's where it begins, and it's also where it comes home. I, that's always been a frustration to me. That the United States had so much to do with the development of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and yet We've been absolutely deficient in applying those very principles that we insisted are important for the whole world to our, uh, to our own domestic understanding as a vehicle for looking at some of the problems we face, but also resolving them. And resolving, them, to me, what's so important is resolving them in a way that is not a zero-sum way of doing it. It's not if I have rights, you don't. It's if I have rights because I'm a human being and you're a human being, then the respect for my rights builds respect for yours. And the respect for yours builds respect for mine. So I don't have to worry that I'm losing something if you're gaining something. If you're gaining something, we're all better for it. And that's that's a very, I, I, I really think that would do wonders for some of the political conflicts we've got in the country right now. So many people feeling like, if they can't dominate, they're going to be dominated. If they can't have the upper hand, then that upper hand is going to be squashing them down. And the whole concept of human rights is no. When the playing field gets level, when humanity is respected, so is your humanity. And any solution that disrespects your humanity is not a human rights friendly solution. Likewise, a solution that disrespects somebody else's is not. So we're going to have to figure out how to do it together. Amazing, amazing concept. <laughs> so Jessica, I will very briefly, we are actually at the end of our hour, aren't we? Yes. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jasmine first, do we have any questions that you want to uh, put forward to us? Um, I, think, I think in the interest of time, because we are at the hour, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, we will also put an email in the chat so you could send them to us and maybe we can respond that way. Okay, that might be a better way to do it. Okay, well, then what I think I will do is, first off, Jessica, let me just briefly ask you to pitch in here about differences you've seen as to way human rights are integrated into the building of a democratic society, which is what they mean by democratic citizenship in Europe. And we mean by uh, democratic civics here in the United States, which is different terms, but similar goal. What are some of the differences you've seen in how the two places try to accomplish the same thing? <laughs> I mean, just to be very brief, because I want to respect everyone's time, but I do think 
that really it's just a matter, you know, in my in my limited experience with it and looking at the two contexts, it's that they're just a little bit farther along and having a broader unified approach where there's a lot of buy-in on uh, for, from all stakeholders. So at the policy level, at the teacher level, non-formal, formal sectors, as I mentioned, vocational, you know, from primary up to higher ed. So there's just a lot more cohesive buy-in. I think that there's a little bit further on, but John, you know, really gave me a ton of hope hearing all of the wonderful stuff that he's a part of and all of the initiatives that he's working toward. It seems like there is over here in the U.S., a real growing movement to make that a, a more broadly applied um, concept for, for everybody. So I'm, I'm grateful to hear all of those updates, but I think that's, that's my, my opinion about it. Well, you know, something, something good may have come out of January 6, 2021, in that people began to finally realize one, that yeah, there's a certain understanding of civics that we have to have, and uh, part two, that uh, whatever that understanding is, it has to make people civil toward each other. It has to make people accepting of each other. We don't, we don't want to brawl our way to any further into the 21st century than we have already. And the combination of democratic civics and human rights education, I guess we would say from this panel, is the way to go there. This is national civics. Learning Week, so those of you who are watching this webinar, I urge you to please remember that civics and human rights education are really good friends, really good buddies, and even relatives. And relatives take care of each other. That's, that's what I learned in my country, <laughs> in my country living as a young person. So with that, we do have at the at, we do have a list of resources. And there is a, on the last screen, there is a uh, link to a, uh, and, and put it in the chat too, so people can copy it, I guess. A, the Civic Learning Week folks have developed for us a survey. So you can tell us what you thought of this webinar and what you think about what we're doing for Civics Learning Week. And I hope you will fill it out because We'd like to know what you thought of this webinar, and we'd like to know that you can see the connection between human rights education and civics education in the democratic society we are all building together.